afternoon and welcome to Farm Country Update, the top five opportunities for the global pork industry. My name is Jennifer Scheich and I'm the editor of Farm Journal's Pork and I'm looking forward to a great discussion today between our panelists who I believe represent areas of thought that are going to invite some of your questions. You know, America's pork industry is continuing to face unprecedented changes and challenges in 2022. But isn't it true that these challenges are often opportunities in disguise? Today, we are going to delve into at least five, because honestly, we had trouble narrowing it down, topics that are on our panelists' minds today that they believe present some of the greatest opportunities in the global pork industry. These topics will be expanded upon and more by some of these panelists and others world-renowned speakers at our upcoming United Pork Americas event on April 19th through the 21st in Orlando. So let's get started. I'd like to begin by asking each of our panelists to introduce themselves and share a little bit about their role in the pork industry. Kent, would you start us off? I sure would, Jennifer, and thanks for having me. Um, uh, I, I live in Omaha, Nebraska, and this is Kent Bang. I, uh, I, I've spent about 42 years um, in the swine industry. Uh, the last 25 plus in commercial lending, uh, uh, by and large, only to uh, commercial swine production. And a little bit of uh, packing financing in there, but, but primarily to producers. Uh, along with that, I've been engaged in the industry in a number of uh, areas. A couple key ones are, I did serve two terms on the NPPC Board of Directors and two terms on the U.S. Meat Export Federation Board as well. Uh, so I try to stay active and continue to stay active in the industry from a, from a national scope. Thank you. Caleb? Yeah, Caleb Shaw. I uh, live in Eastern Illinois and I spent 10 years at the University of Illinois uh, where I started my career. Um, I got a math or my bachelor's in uh, ag finance, and then I transitioned to, to animal science for my master's and, and PhD work. After graduating, I went and worked for the Mash House and have been there ever since. So I'm, I'm nine years into that uh, journey, and I'm currently the director of research and development for them, and I uh, oversee the, the innovation program or, or help lead that program. And we do uh, research in a number of different studies across health, the genetics, nutrition, uh, reproduction, uh, and, and just general production management uh, work. And uh, any, we'll at any point in time have around 100,000 pigs uh, tested every year. So um, we do a, a significant volume of work. And I'm also involved in, in the, the testing program for acuity genetics as well. So excited to be here today. Thank you. And Jimmy. Yes, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Jimmy Tosh. I'm CEO of Tosh Farm. We're a family operation in uh, Henry, Tennessee. And I'm sure that's not on most people's maps, but we're about 125 miles west of uh, Nashville and about 125 northeast of, uh, of Memphis. Uh, we have a crop operation. We farm about 19,000 acres of uh, row crop. We have a swine operation of about 40,000 sows or soon to be 40,000 sows. We also have a construction business. We do all internal construction for our farms and we do all our trucking. Uh, so glad to be on the program today. Well, we're excited to have all of you guys here today and looking forward to a great discussion. Before we get started, I just have a few quick housekeeping details. We highly encourage you to ask questions. So please feel free to submit your questions either in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen, or you can use the chat area as well. We'll be doing our best to get to as many of your questions as we can later in the session. And just to note that this is being recorded and will be available for viewing later. We'll definitely send a copy of the webinar to everyone who registered. So with, let's get started by discussing total pork demand, especially in terms of product innovation and pork consumption. Kent, why don't you start us off? How do we win the battle at the meat case? Well, I think one of the ways, uh, Jennifer, and, and it's really an interesting topic as we continue, in my opinion, to grow demand for pork. And I think a couple of the key contributors to that is uh, maybe with this pandemic, one of the things that we learned is that it's a lot more apparent 
the value of pork in the meat case in a grocery store versus through food, food service, just simply because it's very visible, uh, the price differential in products. We've got a great product at a, at a really reasonable price when you look at it from a meat case standpoint. And I think that's really helped our demand. And I think, uh, um, you know, I, I, we, we talk a lot about product innovation and I think that's one area where, you know, we don't really lead the way when you look at, when you look at poultry or maybe even look at beef, but, uh, I think that's an area that we can continue to grow uh, demand through increased, you know, just just product innovation. Um, we can put product on the shelf, but it's got to be easy. It's got to be something the housewife wants to consume and she knows how to prepare or he or she knows how to prepare and, and make use of. And we have to make it convenient um, and easy to easy to handle and easy to make. So. I think that's some of the product innovation that we need. One of the one of the real bright spots I think here recently, in particular, um, is the, some of the work that National Pork Board did to continue uh, to grow uh, the demand for ground pork. Uh, just a wonderful product that, in in a lot of cases, was hard to find. You had to look for it. A lot of retailers didn't carry it. And I think they've, they've really proven through a lot of retail chains in the Midwest um, that, that this is a good product for consumers the, the, from a demand standpoint. It's a good product from a revenue standpoint for the grocer. So I think that, that's really a simple product uh, use um, uh, that, that really can help us spur demand. I feel good about where we're at overall. I, I think... Uh, you know, we've got a we've got growing demand across the U.S. Uh, we've also got strong export demand, uh, it, uh, particularly in recent years, and I think that continues to grow as well. Yeah, just to expand on on what Kent said, and if you haven't guessed by now, a lot of my answers are going to be uh, answered with an innovation spin. Um, a lot of the 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 momentum behind kind of some of the pork demand, or at least uh, in the U.S., has been we've seen strong belly and rib uh, primal prices, um, but we've seen some of the other primals kind of lag behind. So I think as we look for for additional opportunities, it's a way to, to create more value for some of the, the other primals, like like a loin um, that has historically been strong. Um, so ways that we can do that um, are uh, a continued push for, for quality uh, as an industry, at least in the U.S., we've made a big shift and push towards uh, duroxired uh, pigs throughout uh, the, the supply chain. And I think that's made a, a, a big improvement in the quality of our pork, um, but there's still very few incentives for, for producers to, to select for, for quality. And I think as we look to push that next um, level of, of interest, uh, particularly in the loin, we've got to create a, a good quality product and then be also innovative in terms of how we use that, that product and create it more desirable for the consumer, like Kent mentioned. Jimmy, do you have anything you want to add to that? Well, I echo what uh, both Ken and Caleb say is, uh, uh, one of the things that wasn't mentioned, and I know it's been a, a, a point of emphasis of the uh, pork board, is teaching the uh, chef or the, home, the housewife, as far as that goes, how to cook pork. Uh, they tend to want to cook it to death, my wife included, and I've had to try to teach her. Uh, the other thing is we haven't touched on it, <coughs> is, excuse me, <coughs> is export demand. Uh, this industry is very dependent on export demand, and uh, we have done a great job in, in increasing demand over the years. I mean, 25 years ago, we were a net importer. Now we export 25 to 26 percent of our pork, and we need to continue to uh, put some emphasis on the export demand for our pork product. <coughs> You know, one of the topics that gets brought up in nearly every interview that I do, it really doesn't even matter what topic we're talking about, is the issue of labor. 
And, um, you know, this has been something that we've been dealing with for a long time, and it doesn't appear that it's going to magically get fixed anytime soon. But how do you think this constant struggle presents an opportunity to our global pork industry? Uh, Caleb, do you want to start us off? Yeah, it's a, it's a, a real struggle with the, the days of having people that have good stockmanship, stockmanship skills and that basic level of understanding is, is there, there's fewer and fewer of those people that are out there um, and just fewer people that, that are uh, engaged and want to work in livestock production. Um, I, I think uh, from a production standpoint, we've got to uh, look for ways to, to work around that, that challenge. Uh, one of the things I think that we can do that will also help uh, improve the environment that our uh, people work in is, is enable them with uh, technology, provide them with the information they need to, to better manage their populations and help them be more successful and potentially even allow them to manage uh, more barns and more pigs um, with uh, a lot better decision-making quality. Um, I think I mentioned working environment as an industry. I think we need to continue to think about ways to provide a, a better environment um, for our people. We, we often talk about how to provide the, the right environment for our pigs, but um, we need to start with providing the, the right uh, lighting, clothes, cleanliness, all those things within our facilities. There, there's opportunities there. Uh, I think uh, at least within the U.S., there's been a, a huge movement for TN visa uh, use, and I think that having the ability to, to bring in folks that want to work is a really good thing, um, but we've got to figure out ways to, to deal with uh, having different languages spoken on a farm and how do we provide them with tools and support to be able to, to deal with um, bilingual um, communication on a farm. So those are all uh, areas that, that at least we're working on and, and thinking about um, to try to, to mitigate some of the challenges that we face from a labor standpoint. Yeah, I, I will say that uh, from our operation, we have a great set of employees. We just need some more. Uh, one of the things that we're doing uh, that's kind of outside the box is uh, we're working with a uh, drug rehab center in, in the county. And uh, that has been very, very successful with us. We were very reluctant uh, once uh, we were first approached about doing uh, working some of these workers, but we decided to, to try it and it has been very successful. And some of them are, are turned into long-term employees. Now you do have some failures. I mean, you just have to accept that, but it's been a very good, very good program. Another thing we've started just recently is student loan uh, forgiveness. If an employee comes here, we will pay their student loans off over the, over the term of the loan if they will stay with us. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, and that, uh, that's been, uh, I think it's been very well received. Uh, the other thing that we're looking at is the possibility of uh, a daycare center. Uh, now, I wouldn't want to run it myself, and I probably wouldn't want to be responsible for the people that run it, but if we could hire some outside consulting firm or management firm to, to manage it for us, we're going to take a, take a look at that. Uh, we, we are also using the TN visa program. Uh, I wish the H2A program could be a 12-month program. Uh, where that would work better on, on livestock farms, but uh, it's difficult when they're here to, uh, 10 months and have to go back for two months. So uh, I think everybody's having uh, challenges with labor, but uh, I think some of the points that Kayla brought up are very, very good points too. So I would I would echo the, the innovation that these two have brought up and and uh, just from 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 where I see it, I think this is a this is really going to be a long term issue for our industry, and I think it's going to take that kind of innovation in order to overcome this. And it's not just the production side; it's the processor as well, or even more so, in uh, in finding uh, enough help, finding quality help, finding workers. Uh, 
you know, every day. And that I think the labor force is changing some. And I think one aspect that, that, that these guys both brought up, the immigration piece, I think is an important one. Um, I think the just, in, you know, finding innovative ways to engage employees, the daycare is a great example of that. Uh, those kind of things help. And I think it takes a whole combination of people feeling good about what they're contributing uh, to the company and to the industry and, and feel important about their, their, their job is important, which it is. And uh, I think it's going to take a key, uh, a, a number of those issues to bring the labor force back to where we need it. Plus uh, the ability to find ways to make the job easier, more efficient, um, and using, you know, technology, whether that be robotics and plants, uh, maybe it's uh, robotics even to some degree on the farm um, to, to take some of those tedious jobs and make them a little more uh, attractive. The good thing is taking care of animals and producing food for people is a noble profession. So um, we just need to do a better job of, of training the next generation because um, I, I I struggle to see where that, that training is going to happen if we don't do it ourselves as an industry. So um, that, that needs to be a priority moving forward as well. I would agree. Caleb, you touched on it in, in your comments, but the work environment in, in, the, in the South Farms and stuff, uh, I think the office ought to, ought to be as nice as their, as their home as far as you need to have nice showers and nice, nice kitchen area, nice uh, recreational area. And we've kind of made the emphasis on our, our South Farms to, to, uh, to do that. And I think uh, we've got some good comments from, from doing that. Yeah, I would agree with you, Jimmy. And it's it, the other the other aspect of that, and I, I I see it on farms when I get in there, and you can just, um, you know, when you have a, a group of farm employees that work well together under a team, as a team, under a leader, that they all feel part of of trying to do accomplish something together. Um, you can you can see it in their eyes. You can tell in the way they walk, uh, the way they go about their job. And it's a great thing and trying to, I mean, it does come down in part to uh, once you have them on board, you know, making them feel like they're part of a larger team. I think that's critical. And I know you guys work hard to do that. And it's, uh, you know, but it takes everybody pulling to get that job done. I've, I've been fortunate to visit both of your, uh, you know, at least one of your sow barns your farms and I have to say that the atmosphere and the attitude of your of your employees is just it's contagious I mean it just makes you want to go work there because everybody's really motivated enjoys what they do and, and I think that's a really special thing and I think more more of you who are doing it well we need to find out what are you doing that works so well because it's it's a great inspiration and it just it seems like a great place to work. And isn't that what we all hope that we get to do is work somewhere that we enjoy every day. So, you know, <coughs> that we, we discussed too is um, the topic of disease and health. And I was visiting with Scott D the other day about his in uh, the United Pork Americas. And he was saying that he thinks that one of the biggest opportunities that we have right now is to keep African swine fever out. And so obviously I know that's a very big goal in our country right now, but what do you think, Jimmy, what do you think um, when it comes to disease and overall pig health, how, how does that create opportunities for the pork industry? Well, definitely African swine fever if it got into this country will be devastating at least for a short period of time. Uh, so this industry is doing everything we can to, to keep it out. Uh, one of the advantages we have in our operation, and uh, we're in Tennessee, we're 95% of the production in Tennessee, and uh, we don't have the disease issues that uh, has, has to be dealt with in the, in the Midwest. Uh, we had our first PERS break this year since 2008, and it was very mild strain. It was vaccine strain. So there is advantage to being out of the main production area of, of pigs. and. Uh, I mean, there's some disadvantages too, but there is definitely some some advantages. So, uh, but pig health is very very important to 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 top notch production. Uh, 
you can do, and it's a lot easier on employees too. They don't have to deal with sick pigs and, and dread, drag dead pigs out. So uh, it's it's very, very important to be uh, very productive in this industry. I think that, that that's really well said, Jimmy. And, and uh, knowing your situation with PERS, that makes a lot of people in Iowa and Minnesota and uh, feel 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 bad um, because it's not that easy here with the pig density that we have. But I, I, I think you nailed it pretty well. I mean, it, we've really got two issues and one is the, uh, you know, the foreign animal disease, whether that be, you know, I know all the focus is on African swine fever, but the mouth disease is a, is another issue and it's been around, um, it, it's, it's been around the Western hemisphere uh, for quite some time. And so those both would be you know, uh, uh, export ending at least for a short period of time uh, diseases. And, and so I look at that on one hand, but, but second, and, and Jennifer, you asked a little bit about a discussion around, uh, you know, production diseases or, or diseases here, which Jimmy talked about, but, you know, whether it be PERS or PDD, I think those are really, I think, opportunities uh, for our industry to try to get a better handle on, you know, both control, um, maybe treatment, maybe some protocols that we've done over the last decade that maybe don't work with some of the PERS strains today nearly as well. Um, and, and I don't know how far it is out, but I think working towards a PERS resistant pig uh, still has huge value and implications for this uh, industry. Um, just thinking that perhaps we'll never be able to eradicate PERS from the U.S. and, and it has been a devastating, uh, very contagious and, and moving again this year. And so um, I think getting control on that, particularly that disease in PDD and there are others, um, but those two in particular to, to uh, uh, really work as, a, uh, as, an or as an industry to try to get a better control and handle on pig movements and, and how we spread that disease around. I would agree and echo everything Jimmy and Kent said, just to maybe add a little bit on maybe some of the opportunities on, on the health innovation side. I, I think there's an opportunity to really focus on vaccine improvements. Um, can we take some of the learnings from our current human health crisis and then COVID and and some of the learnings from the rapid mRNA vaccine development and, and apply that to the pig industry. Uh, time will tell, we, but we do need new tools for managing PERS, PD, uh, even uh, SIV flu uh, kills a lot of pigs uh, in the U.S. every year. Um, so we, we need better vaccine tools and uh, I'm confident that hopefully we'll get those over, over time. We mentioned the labor struggle. Um, Vaccination is is uh, a big labor demand. So can we figure out new and creative ways to to give those uh, vaccines to our pigs? Um, I think on the treatment side, um, I think to really make advancements there, and I think we do need to focus more on treatment. As, as Kent said, um, we're not going to necessarily eliminate those diseases from um, our production system. So how do we deal with them? How do we treat them? Um, I think technology can help us in getting more rapid uh, detection of when those pigs are getting sick, which if we can get in earlier in that disease window, hopefully we can do some things that, that are, are more successful from a treatment standpoint. So um, how do we build the immune uh, function? How do we uh, think differently about immune stimulants that help those animals get through those disease challenges, I think will be, should be a priority uh, moving forward as well. You know, and kind of following up with that a little bit too, you know, the topic of sustainability is definitely, uh, an, you know, an issue that is all around us. And it's hard to deny the opportunity that sustainability of the pork industry presents. How do we as an industry become part of the solution for what consumers want to see from a sustainability standpoint? Can, can you lead us off with your perspective and how we might be able to connect some of these dots? Well, and yeah, I sure could. And I, I, I think this is really a, a, 
it, it, it is a fascinating area, and I think it's going to be such a critical area for us. And I, I have to be honest with you, I've looked at this from a standpoint of, you know, the pork industry and agriculture in general kind of has a target on its back and we're, you know, everybody's attacking us. It's unfair. The, you know, lots of wild accusations about what's the carbon footprint of our, uh, of agriculture. And I mean, some really wild stuff, but all of that said, I think we have a great opportunity as an industry to turn the table on that and really make that a make make agriculture and the swine industry part of that solution and i and i think number one i think understanding metrics about uh, defining and understanding metrics about on farm uh, you know what is our carbon footprint you know what what is our sustainability goals uh, where are we at today in relation to those goals and we we are I think there's a lot of people that are really smart working on some of those uh, metrics and solutions and, and getting a baseline, if you will. Um, and I would encourage people, I'm, I'm maybe talking out of school a little bit, but there's a pilot project that National Pork Board has worked on. I, I'm assuming they could take more people, I don't know. So maybe you call them and they say, well, for right now we're good, but it's certainly worthwhile to understand where we're at today and where we can take this. Because I think not only can uh, the swine industry and the meat industry be a solution, <coughs> this, I, I think producers can capitalize from this long term. I mean, there are, we have some great opportunities. Um, I, and I, you look at this industry and, and being involved in it my entire life, you know, we, we are such better stewards of our resources. You look at any metric you want to from, uh, uh, you know, use of feed, use of land to produce pork, all of those issues. And, and we are so much better than we were. And we continue to get better. And we've called that, you know, we've, we've called that efficiency gains. And, uh, you know, it's nothing other than it's sustainability for sure. And that's what we need to focus on in my mind going forward to become that, that solution, make uh, capitalize from it. But I think we have to have a baseline to start from and and uh, I'd say my, my, the best thing we could do would be go back about 10 years and use that as a baseline, but I don't know if we'll be allowed to do that. So I look forward to it. I think it's a great opportunity for our industry. That's a great point. I, I will just interject really quick to say that the um, issue of pork, Farm Journal's pork is just actually came to my door today and our cover story is all about that program and goes into detail about how more people can get signed up. And it is just incredible to me how um, people can connect those dots and be able to show us like, you know, in real tangible ways of how we have made those improvements. And I, I still agree with you. It's, I wish we had those metrics from 10 years ago in a way that we could really show, but that's why it's important to start getting those metrics today. Right, and I do know that, I mean, guys like Jimmy Tosh that are on here, the mass mm -hmm. shops, other clients and people that I've worked with, I, I know they've made those improvements over the last 10 and 20 years. And, and there's, there's no question that it's much more sustainable um, every year. And their goal is to continue to improve it. So why not utilize that to tell the story? I couldn't agree more with what Kent and Jenna, Jennifer said. There's a lot of good work being done and there's still work to do to help improve how we communicate our story. We have a good story to tell. Um, there's um, still opportunity that out there to, to further drive how we use resources and, and we need to continue to keep pushing that because the production producers that, that uh, utilize those resources uh, best are going to be the ones here that, that have the staying power. And I think part of sustainability is producing uh, food at an affordable price. So that has to be factored into the equation of, of, of sustainability. Yeah, I wish we could go back further than 10 years ago. I mean, when I started farming back in the 70s, uh, you know, we had over 8 million sows in this country today. We have a few over 6 million and we're producing a lot more pork off the six and we were off the eight. Feed efficiency has increased dramatically over the years. 
Uh, I am going to be part of the National Pork Board Sustainability Pro Project. We're starting that next week with them, and I think we can we have a good uh, a good story to tell. I think the industry has a good, really good story to tell about sustainability. Uh, one thing about sustainability, we need the ability to use new technology as it comes along in the future. And I do have some worry about uh, as the technology comes along, are we going to be able to use it? One of them was mentioned earlier, the uh, PERS uh, uh, resistant pig. So, uh, but uh, I, I have no problem telling them the sustainability uh, part of the uh, pork industry, how much, how much we've improved over the years. Well, and another area of the improvement has been in our production metrics, as, as you guys have alluded to. And to me, that's what's so exciting about the pork industry is just how, how much progress takes place all the time and how we are producing more with less, but how we're also improving our productivity on the farm. Caleb, can, you, um, can we continue to do this in a way that's going to allow us to keep improving across all of the metrics and not just a few? Um, we, we visited a little bit about that the other day. Could you shed a little light on that for us? Yeah, I, I do think there will be continued advancements. Obviously, we've seen a PSY pigs per sow per year trend that, that's been fairly strong. Um, and we have continued to see um, really good growth in feed conversion in some of the, uh, in, in the wean to market phase of our production. Um, I think the the big opportunity uh, for us is to, to take a, a holistic look and, and focus on the, the value that's given up across our supply chain. And, and um, a lot of that value is, is, in the, is given up through uh, mortality, whether it be in sows, piglets, growing pigs. Um, but there's also opportunity just in um, the misses that we have uh, across the supply chain from a management standpoint. We, we talked about some of the labor challenges uh, earlier. Um, do we always provide the pig the right environment to, to, to thrive? Um, I'd say there's major gaps across the industry, um, just given how the industry has been constructed. So how, how can we utilize technology to, to gain insight into what's going on uh, in the barns uh, real time uh, to drive uh, the people that we do have to those uh, challenges so that they can react proactively um, to provide the best uh, care to our animals. So I think moving forward, we, we will continue to see uh, pressure on, on throughput and productivity of our, our sows and lean uh, gain of our pigs and, and wean to market. But I do think we've got to do it in a sustainable way that, that ends up with uh, less dead pigs uh, across our, our supply chain because um, it's, it's a responsibility of all of us to, to drive efficiency uh, and, and to promote animal care and promote uh, animal uh, of an environment that our animals will thrive in. So I think that needs more attention and um, rather than necessarily uh, chipping away at those, those production metrics, I think there needs to be a, a focus on trying to minimize the, the losses across our supply chain that, that we inevitably see um, as a result of some of the rapid growth in, in our, our production metrics that we've seen in the last five to 10 years. Well, I, I would agree with everything you said, uh, Caleb. I mean, I'm I'm anxious to see the new technology that's coming up, that could come down to help us manage the barns and the pigs better. we we'll discover a problem before it comes a, a problem, where we can get in there and, and deal with it. Uh, now we do have some issues in this industry. I mean, uh, uh, this prolapse in, issue is we need to find a solution to that, whatever the whatever the cause. It is, but there uh, again, I, there is a wide variation of production still in this industry. I mean, if you look at the Metafarm numbers from anywhere from 18 to 35 PSY, and average producers are around 26. So there's still a tremendous area uh, area of improvement that could be that could occur in this industry. 
Because uh, my, my contribution to this would be, it's going to reiterate exactly what you two have said, I think. I, I, as, as you see farms out there that can, can produce 35 pigs weaned per sow per year, uh, we, see, we see closeouts that, are, uh, that would gain over two pounds a day, well over two pounds a day, and conversions that are, are extremely good with mortalities of less than 5%. Now, we know that that's the genetic potential. We know it's out there, but we've talked a lot about uh, the issues. It's environment, it's health, it's, it's a lot of those issues around that. Uh, uh, and, and, and it takes labor to make sure that that's all happening. And, and so I think with all that put together, I think we will continue to improve those metrics as has been said. Um, but it, it takes all of that to get it done. And, and then on top of that, and we started with that a little bit, but also continue to improve meat quality while we do that. And so I, I think the opportunity is very good for us to continue to improve those metrics. It's never easy. Never has been, Jimmy, right? So, um, right. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, Ken, we're, we're still capturing a fairly small percentage of the, the potential of our genetics um, these days, if you uh, actually take a put a pig in, in the ideal environment, um, it, it's amazing what they can do from a growth and feed conversion standpoint. Um, but and, and part of that's uh, Jimmy mentioned the, the prolapse issue. Um, we've got to do a better job from a genetic standpoint of of testing um, our animals and the environments they're going to be raised in. And 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 I think there's tremendous opportunities to clean up some of the the hidden uh, issues that, that we've got, whether it be prolapse, whether it be um, just, just sow mortality in general, there's an opportunity or pig mortality across the supply chain. There's an opportunity to, to really focus on that from a genetic standpoint. And um, I think you'll, you'll see a push for that uh, in the future here. All right, well, we are going to move into some of the questions from our audience today. Uh, we appreciate your questions. Feel free to, to add to our Q&A section at any time. We'll do our best to get them answered, but let's start off with one. What are the primary hurdles in automation and barn technology adoption among producers, and how can the tech industry adapt to the needs of swine managers and caretakers? I think probably uh, um, some of the hurdles may be uh, just a, a lack of knowledge of how it might work. I think about some of the technology. I've seen some robotic uh, power washers that I think I'm just looking in my own, just from my own experience. And I think that's got to be helpful, right? That's a tedious job. It has to be done every day in the farm. And uh, so here's an opportunity. And, and I, I'm not sure exactly why it doesn't get more adopt, adoption. Maybe it's, maybe it's cost. Maybe it's just they're uncertain of the mechanics. There may be other reasons as well. But those kind of things that, uh, uh, for, for one, would, uh, would help. Um, just monitoring the facility from, um, you know, from one location, I think, is pretty well adopted, in, at least in newer facilities. And so... Um, instead of running around the farm checking temperatures, humidity, all that, we, you know, people are probably bringing it up on their phone at this time, or at least from a central office. So, I think some of those technologies are, are, uh, you know, are, are available, and and there's probably more and more coming, I'm sure, just because of the cost of labor. Yeah, there's several hurdles that that have prevented technology from from entering. The, the swine industry. Um, one is the, the infrastructure in which we're raising our pigs. A, a large percentage of our barns in, in the U.S. at least are, are still quote unquote unconnected barns that, that we don't have. We have very poor connectivity um, out where the pigs are, are being raised. Um, that's going to change over time, but um, that, that does take time to evolve and, and get some of those uh, equipment and facility up, upgrades um, put in place. I think the other challenge that I mentioned is just can't mention cost. Um, I think we do operate in the commodity market and we've got to 
make sure that our cost is, is uh, aligned with the value that's going to be created from that, the technology. And uh, I think that the challenge is when you have lots of cool, exciting technologies that work in a specific uh, or provide a specific use case, um, you add up the cost of all those technologies, they, they become unbearable. So how do we combine these technologies in a way that, and then integrate them to where they, that you only, not only create um, value from that one data feed, but it's the one plus one equals three concept where you combine multiple <laughs> data feeds and, and then can actually drive more value um, because you continually getting smarter as you add in those technology platforms. So a way to integrate um, the, the technology components um, is really important. And there's uh, most of the technologies, the, the new technologies that have come out there have been um, not, not a taking that approach where it's, it's an integrated solution. Um, so I think you'll see an evolution uh, over the next five to 10 years. I think you'll see the cost of the technology becoming more attractive as cameras and other, um, just the hardware becomes more affordable. Um, I do think we're going to see uh, an uptick in technology adoption in the next five to 10 years. I'd be highly shocked if our pig barns look the same as they did um, five to 10 years ago. We've been saying that for uh, a long time now, but I, I do think we're at the point now where um, we've got um, several of the, the recipes needed to, to help with technology adoption. I look forward to the day and, and I, I, I thought it would be at least in my lifetime and maybe I, I still do to some degree where we have uh, driverless trucks. And that's a technology that it may not help us back a truck up and load pigs and haul them to the next farm, but it would should make more drivers available that want to drive. And uh, so maybe that haul becomes from Chicago to LA as a driverless truck, but the local the local hall is still a person. And so I think that's one opportunity maybe it, that uh, uh, seems like it's coming and, and innovation in other areas. Uh, I, you know, I've thought about it long and hard with the, the swine industry needs the equivalent of the robotic milker in dairy, which you take the most labor intensive job on the farm and, and there, you know, there is robotics. I don't think we have it. We've got a hands-on industry and, uh, uh, that's going to be hard to get away from the, the <laughs> hands-on pig care, in in my opinion. Yeah, I would agree. I I think we're at least where we need to start is just uh, making the the information that we have collect the day manually. A lot of farms still use all paper and and get that that information to caretakers and to managers of, of barns, um, so they have the information real time. That's a small step in that direction and. And um, then we can add on sensors, platforms to, to an existing um, infrastructure that that's a, our data management um, system that allows um, decisions to, to be made on, on real-time information. And then you can continue to iterate on that moving forward. I, I don't think, or I think a lot of systems are gonna just struggle to, to jump all in on a completely new, new platform. It's gonna be an iterative approach. Um, but I, I think there's an appetite for, for uh, understanding what's going on in the barns and, and there's an appetite for technology <laughs> to satisfy that, that need. Right. Yeah, well, one, of, one of the things that we, well, I was gonna say one of the things we're using on our farm, uh, on one of our larger farms is the camera that counts pigs as we're loading them. And that we've discovered that to be accurate and also time time saving on 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 the loading crew too. So that's just one area of innovation that's uh, available out there. So we've got quite a few questions popping up about Prop Twelve. So I'm just I think what I may do is just kind of hit a couple of the questions here for you and let you guys kind of take a different stab at it, depending on your perspective. But we've got questions regarding how are you planning to deal with the Prop 12 issue related to your facilities? And um, also, let's discuss a 
there's a question about raising, how does Prop 12 raise the price of pork for the nation? Seems like if we have an additional 12 to 14% more pork that used to be, but now can't be sold in California, that that would make pork cheaper in the balance of states. So here are some of your thoughts on Prop 12. Well, I've got a little update from uh, Craig Bowling with the uh, NPPC. Uh, he sent me an email today, and the uh, Supreme Court is going to uh, it's going to be up for consideration again this Friday, and uh, they should have a ruling by the first of the week. I mean, it, the three things can happen: it can not, not be taken up, uh, it can take, be taken up by the SCOTUS, or the Supreme Court asks for information. Because so that's the latest update as far as we're at on the court uh, court system there. Uh, the problem with Prop 12 that I see is if California wants to have pork produced under Prop 12 conditions, they should have had the rules and regulations out in plenty of time for the producing segment to adapt. Uh, it's hard to adapt to a, a regulation which you don't know what the final rules are at. Uh, there is some talk that one of the retailers is going to be Prop 12 compliant, whether the Supreme Court rules whether it's constitutional or not. And honestly, I really don't have a problem with that as long as somebody pays for it. If the, if the consumer wants to pay for it and got to realize there was a cost, I'm, I'm fine with it. We, we would be willing to produce under those rules and regulations, but uh, there's a cost to Prop 12 and somebody needs to pay for it. Yeah, I would agree with you, Jimmy. I mean, I think, uh... Um, I, I'm not sure if it'll make pork in the rest of the states cheaper. I don't, I don't believe that. I think it's going to make, my opinion would be that it's going to make pork more expensive across the nation, but not as much as it would in California if this would go through. Uh, just simply because if we would raise 15% of the, you know, uh, if, if we would supply 15% of their product, it's probably going to take a little more than that. Uh, to be able to supply it just because of logistics and other factors. So that that piece is a concern to me. And I would agree with Jimmy. If somebody wants a, you know, if they're willing to pay uh, um, what it would take from a retailer standpoint, they've got every right. I, but I don't feel like the state does. Um, as a lender with a lot of swine accounts, um, you know, we, we've got producers, we have clients that are uh, remodeling older facilities. We've got just a handful that are building some new facilities to produce uh, pigs and, and some of those already under construction. So, um, uh, you know, there is, there is some response. I have no idea uh, if, you know, uh, that in itself clearly wouldn't be 15%, but, uh, you know, that might be a small percentage of that. And, and, uh, and we're, uh, uh, they'll likely get there at some point in time. I think, uh, you know, the, the, there's there's a significant cost to this, and it, it's going to vary a lot between from one producer to another, depending on what what they have when they start remodeling or or building something that is Prop 12 and how they do it. But uh, I would say, you know, significant cost on a per head basis to get this accomplished. Yeah, the big impact to our business would be the, the space requirements and, and the implications that has on, on how many made inventory we can have on a already established sow farm. We would have to to expand the or build new sow farms to to the tune of uh, around thirty percent or more to to be able to satisfy um, and maintain the same level of of made inventory um, within our system. So. That's going to obviously increase the, the cost structure, increase the fixed cost uh, of raising pigs. And as Jimmy said, it's got to be passed on somewhere. So I think that's um, the concern is that if it passes in, in California or get, it goes forward, um, does it get used, that strategy get used in other states? Um, I think we got to do a better job of educating the voters in terms of what they're voting for. And they're voting for higher food costs in many cases there. And uh, if that's that's what people want, then we need to figure out how to be nimble and flexible and, and grow uh, 
products that, that people want. Um, but I think in many cases, um, most people don't want higher food costs. Um, so we got to do a better job of, of educating. And we've got one for you. Um, interested in what Compeer and others in the finance community can or are doing to create enabling conditions that make it easier for the diverse range of producers to transition towards more sustainable practices at an enterprise level. Wow, that's a, that's a tough one. And so we are uh, certainly encouraging producers to get engaged in the sustainability. And, you know, I meant to say this earlier, but in my mind, you know, number one, you know, in the sustainability is, is that you, you know, maintain business continuity and that means you're profitable. Um, you, you've got to continue to do, to produce pigs in a way that is profitable for the producer to be sustainable and long-term. I think a lot of what we do, I think the, the metrics will drive a better efficiency and better use of resources on the farm. I think a lot of what we uh, can accomplish uh, from improving sustainability in, in terms of carbon footprint for pork producers is how you source grain and how that's handled. That's a, such a huge component of that. Um, and so as you get into that and, and, and start to develop the metrics, a lot of that is going to be in and around how, uh, how the land is handled and how the crop is produced. And, um, you know, it's going to vary area to area for sure. Um, North Carolina is not Iowa. Um, it, there are going to be different uh, sorts of production, uh, sustainable met metrics, sustainability metrics between the two. Um, we we haven't we don't have any uh, kind of a uh, I don't know how to say this. We don't have kind of a, a, a thou shalt from a sustainable sustainability standpoint. Uh, thank God. Um, um, but uh, certainly we know it's important. We think it's good uh, for the producer to be able to, uh, um, to continue and tell the story and at some point capitalize on the opportunity here. And uh, I think we can, we can lower, we can lower uh, resource use across the board, whether that be land, water, uh, air quality, we, we can make, uh, continue to make significant improvements and I think we should. From a lending standpoint, we're not at the point where we're going to try and force people to make those decisions today. So I'm going to move us on because I know we've got a few more questions that came in, and I'm, I'm sorry that I kind of need to keep things moving to respect our time frame here, but I really did want to circle back with each of you. Are there any other opportunities that you think need to be mentioned or brought up today that you think people should be paying attention to right now in the pork industry. Um, Kent, do you want to start off? Well, I would think one that's one that's near and dear to me, just simply because with the client base that I work with, it is a, it is a big issue. Um, and just because of when we grew this industry and the age of most of the participants, uh, secession planning is a big deal for our, for most of our clients as they move this farm and develop the farm into the next generation. And that takes a long time to plan. Um, I think people need to be thinking about that when they're in their 40s, probably, and, and uh, not when they're in their 60s, uh, just to make sure you're developing the right plan. And I think, you know, I think for most of our clients, uh, a legacy business is important to them. And so succession so planning is important to them as well. Yeah, I would agree with Kent that that's important. We're seeing that uh, in a lot of our uh, production partners that, that built barns with the intention of passing that on to, to their sons or daughters. And, and a lot of those uh, folks aren't coming back to the, the family farm. So figuring out how we're going to raise um, pigs and who's going to take care of those pigs in the future. We talked about all the labor uh, challenges. Are, are we going to lean on independent contractors? Is that going to become uh, more popular within the industry? How, how do we manage independent contractors um, is, is another topic that probably needs more discussion um, to, to align with production company goals and, and minimize um, risk to, to businesses. So 
I think there's going to be continue to be change and uh, those folks who are uh, innovative and flexible and willingness to adapt to the change are going to be the most successful in my opinion. Very true. Well, as, as the old bald headed fellow on the on the call, uh, succession planning definitely is a uh, is a big issue. Uh, lots of these four corporations today started in their eighties and nineties, and and the owners that started them are getting up in years, and uh, uh, it's it's definitely an issue on our farm here, and I'm sure it is on as it is on other farms. Well, I just want to thank everybody for joining us today. I, I really wish that we had more time to talk about these topics, and I'm sorry we couldn't get all the questions answered, but I encourage you to join us in a warmer, sunnier place in April for United Pork Americas. Um, you can learn more about it at unitedporkamericas.com. It's going to be a really unique opportunity to learn more about some of the mega trends that are impacting global pork production and how you can succeed in this dynamic industry. Plus, we're going to have some fun, too and it'll be a beautiful location. So I sure hope you can join us there. We also want to invite you to come back next week for the next Farm Country update on January 26th, the State of Sustainable Ranching. You can go register now at farmjournal.com. And as an addition, I just want to remind you guys that the webinar recording will be available soon on farmjournal.com and a link will be sent out to everyone who registered. Really hope to see you guys at Iowa Pork Congress next week. Um, don't be a stranger. Please stop by our farm <sighs> pork booth. And with that, I wish you guys a great afternoon. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank, Thank you. you.